information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me on the line all the way from Santa Monica in California, I have Michael Maloney, Maloney uh, who is of, the, of goldsilver.com. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. It's great to be here. Now, um, I, it, in the sort of little pre-chat I had, um, you expressed a huge interest in educating people uh, about the importance of gold and silver. Tell me just a little bit about um, why you feel this is necessary. Well, um, like I said, we're really an education company that uh, funds the education because we give away all of our uh, educational materials, everything that we can research and find out and uh, uh, know about monetary history and the global economy, we share and most of that goes out at no charge. Uh, and so we're an education company that funds itself by the uh, sale of precious metals. But um, what we're trying to do, uh, there is a, in a, a very real danger that, uh, well, one of the things I was saying uh, before we started was that uh, there is a financial crisis headed straight towards us. There is no way of avoiding it. Uh, it will happen within this decade. And uh, I said that very often when there is uh, great monetary upheaval, there's great political change that goes along with it. And it's almost always for the worse. Uh, we were talking about the rise of Napoleon was due to a hyperinflation. There were two hyperinflations during the French Revolution. Nobody knew who Napoleon was. He distinguished himself by quelling some food riots in uh, Paris. That were direct, the riots were direct response to this hyperinflation. Uh, and of course, and you, you also mentioned Hitler um, and so on. I mean, this is this is absolutely right. The, the, the two things go together, I think, like bread and butter, don't they? Um, sort of coming coming to the, the current situation. I mean, I find this really quite quite extraordinary because all the major paper currencies are coming to a crisis at the same time. Yeah. Um, I mean, you in America, you have. Um, I mean. Well, I, you know, money is just accelerating at um, a hyperbolic rate. That's the only right. way I can describe it. Yeah, it's um, going to be a trillion bucks a year, basically, you know. And so every year they're going to print more currency than, than took 200 years to create yes. from, from uh, the beginning of our country, the, uh, the U.S., until uh, the crisis of 2008, you know, it took... 200 years to go from no dollars in existence to 825 billion paper dollars. Based absolutely, money. absolutely. Uh, and now they're going to print 85 billion, you know, coming up. Right now it's 40 billion a month. But once Operation Twist ends at the end of the year here, uh, January, it's going to step up to about 85 billion, according to the uh, uh, San Francisco Federal Reserve governor. Uh, and uh, that works out to just over a trillion bucks a year. So. You, but you know the extraordinary thing, Mike. Uh, um, it looks to me as if a uh, trillion dollars is not going to be enough. I think um, the, the the amount of money that's required to stop the whole thing falling over is now looking like two hundred billion a month. You know, <clears throat> they can try and stop it from falling over, and they can uh, print the currency until it's completely worthless. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the, what, what else are they doing? Mass <laughs> exodus out of currency and into money. Yeah, and uh, and you know. On that, it, it doesn't require um, Ben Bernanke printing us into a hyperinflation for gold to go to astronomical values. All it requires is a few really large investors. Uh, you know, if, if uh, a few billionaires decided that they were just going to convert all their assets to gold uh, and, and then other people starting to follow them, uh, yeah, well, the, 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 the trouble I have with that is that uh, the gold isn't there. It's all disappeared off into the Far East, as, so far as I can see. Yeah, and, you know, people go into the ETFs and stuff like that, like Soros, you know, I think he'll be uh, 
pretty disappointed one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a sense, uh, uh, Mr. Soros, I think, I, th I, I think uh, even though I disagree with his understanding of economics, I would say that he is one very, very shrewd man. And, um, you know, I would have thought that going into the GLD, which is adding to his position, um, might give some people a bit, a bit more comfort about GLD. Do you think that's sensible or...? Or, or, or completely wishful thinking. Well, I think it does give people comfort uh, with GLD. I just think that there will come a day, though, uh, when uh, doubt is cast on whether or not uh, there's actually the gold to back it up. But simply the fact that you can short it means that uh, in GLD, you're not buying gold. You're buying a share in a fund that's uh, where the bank is the trustee of it. And uh, if the bank fails, you become a creditor of the bank. And even if they had the gold, you would be getting pennies on the dollar. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, that's, that is certainly the, the, the big, big risk. And I'm interested you mentioning this shorting thing, because I think that's a bit bizarre that you can short um, an ETF, then you can destroy the shares uh -huh. which you have borrowed so that those shares have to be recreated for the original owner to have his claim back. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, I th to me, to me, that's that 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 is uh, insecure. Uh, you know, yeah. quite if, simply. If somebody owns supposedly owns gold with GLD, and uh, the uh, bank that's running it borrows shares out of GLD, and then somebody gets to they loan them to somebody who who then sells them into the market shorting. Now two people own the same ounces of gold. Yeah, exactly. I've said, you know, if it's if it's not. You have to have something real that can't be, uh, uh, where, where it's not a paper claim on gold uh, because the precious metals markets are too highly leveraged. For everybody that actually owns an ounce of gold, there's, there's like 100 people that think they own an ounce of gold. <laughs> yeah, I know that's um, th that that is a serious concern, and uh, it's it's a recipe for people running in the same direction at the same time and finding that the red is actually none there. Um, I'm 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 particularly interested that um, you know this the gold and silver seems to be uh, moving from America every time the paper market uh, pushes the price down. The physical seems to be going over to the east. Uh, is this something that people are very much aware of in America, do you think, or am I just being paranoid? Uh, only the, the people in the industry seem to be aware about it, of it. The public hasn't got a clue. Um, and, you know, this whole thing uh, with uh, the, you know, printing a trillion dollars a year says that there is a major, major emergency right in front of us, and Ben Bernanke is scared to death. And his only response to everything is to create more currency. Uh, it's going to end badly, and with all the gold flowing to the east, uh, you know, we're going to wake up and find out that there isn't any here. And the people that actually do own gold and silver uh, that isn't a paper claim check on gold and silver, those people will uh, find that their purchasing power has gone up astronomically. Uh, that was one of the things I talked about in the book. The, the differences between this precious metals bull market and the last precious metals bar, uh, bull market are mind-boggling. In the last precious metals bull market of the 70s, it was only North America and Western Europe that pushed the price of gold. There was the London Metals Exchange and the Commodities Exchange in the United States, and that's what sets the worldwide spot price. Uh, if you lived in the USSR, it was a state-run economy. There are no markets, and even if you could buy gold on the black market, it did not contribute to the price of gold, ultimately. Uh, uh, China under Mao, that was a very... A uh, poor country at the time, even if it's part of their tradition, uh, still, uh, if somebody could buy gold in China, it did not affect the worldwide spot price. Uh, Mexico, South America, uh, you know, most countries were quite poor at the time. Now there's billionaires in all those countries and there's markets. And, uh, you know, like the Shanghai Stock Exchange, we've gone from 
a country that didn't have an investor in it, not one in the entire country, <laughs> same thing with the USSR. Uh, and we've gone from that to uh, uh, a world where there are billionaires that live in all of those countries that can instantly access the markets. And gold is, uh, you know, traded, it, it's a pretty much a 24 hour a day uh, trading range because you've got uh, markets that open in Australia and Hong Kong. And, and uh, so the price now is basically set by almost everybody on the planet, except for maybe North Korea and a couple of countries like that. Uh, so you have 10 times the number of people that can rush into this market and will one day, uh, each with about 10 times the currency. Yeah, uh, I, absolutely. And and um, uh, I think also that there was a lot of buying uh, in the 80s from the oil-rich nations because they had huge quantities of surplus dollars. So this is a tradition that really started, I think, almost um, from the time of that bull market in the 70s and has gone on ever since. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's just that, you know, most people... I, I was talking with a group of people a couple of weeks ago, and I was telling them that I wrote the best-selling book on investing in precious metals. And the guy says, well, so what are you going to do now? Uh, you know, gold already peaked. It's in a bubble. Uh, so what are you going to do with the rest of your life, basically? Is what he was <laughs> and then I asked him, you know, do you study this? Do you study the, the currency supplies and what's going on? And no, he, that, this is the perception public has. When gold peaked at 1900, it was in a bubble. They don't compare it to the growth of the currency supplies around the planet. And that's the only real, you know, gold isn't just a commodity, it's money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I think that uh, bringing, you know, sort of bringing out your point a little bit further, um, really, people, I think, looking at look at it upside down, what they should be looking at is the loss of purchasing power of the paper rather than a change in the price of gold itself, because gold still buys what it used to buy. Well, uh, actually, you know, people say that gold preserves purchasing power, and it does, except it bounces up and down in a range of purchasing power. There are periods of time uh, when gold doesn't buy enough stuff, and then there are periods of time where it buys too much stuff, like January of 1980, when it hit 850 against a currency supply, it was about one-tenth the size of what it is now in the United States. Uh, but you know, throughout history, gold all does purchase something. But there is no time in 5,000 years that gold was as unloved and ignored as the year 2000. And there was no time in history where paper assets were more uh, loved and overrated, basically, as in the year two, you know, 1999, 2000, with the peak of the NASDAQ bubble and the dot-com stocks and so on. Uh, and so you've got this reversion from, the, you know, from 1971. Uh, this is the first time on the planet where gold is no nation's money. You know, it isn't being used as money. And then uh, from 1980 to 2000, it was in a brutal bear market. And by the year 2000, investors had just completely given up on it. Nobody wanted to hear about gold. When I first started uh, trying to get people into gold back in uh, when it was uh, 300 400 $500 an ounce, I couldn't. It was really difficult. I'd say, you got to buy gold. And they'd say, gold is the worst investment you could possibly make. It's been going down for 20 years. And I go, exactly. It's been going down for 20 years. <laughs> yes, and uh, but it's still difficult today, isn't it, Mike? I mean, um, I, you know, when I talk to people about gold, uh, they think, I mean, you, some of the phrases you've used, it's in a bubble. Um, and, uh, you know, isn't it just a sort of another commodity, which is actually completely useless? And, you know, all this stuff gets trotted out. But I think I'm right in saying that portfolio exposure is as low as it's ever been in the West. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Nobody really owns it yet. Uh, you talk to somebody about gold and they'll show you their ring or their watch or some people's jewelry and say they own gold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think if we can just move on slightly from, from gold. I mean, how are you looking at silver? Because that's, um, that's uh, sort of a fairly hairy ride for people. But, um, you know, there's a sort of uh, some people say that 
uh, you know, the right ratio is uh, 16 ounces of silver to one of gold, and here we are at 50 or something, and uh, therefore it's very underpriced, uh, so it's being sat on and so on. What's your take on the silver price? Well, personally, um, I own about 90% silver and 10% gold, uh, you know, weighted by the price of, you know, the the amount of investment measured in U.S. dollars. Uh, I am a true believer in uh, silver being, you know, I mean, for the first uh, couple thousand years that gold and silver were money, uh, their average rate over that time period was about 12 to 1. The Earth's crust, is, I guess, has about 17 times more silver than gold in it, but mineable supplies uh, has been 12 to 1. And I believe that it's simply uh, the, the free markets, the marketplace, doing the price discovery mechanism. If you dug up gold and silver throughout history and those two coins become money, it's uh, uh, just the marketplace trying to figure out the true values of these things. Uh, you know, you're trying to get somebody to let go of a loaf of bread and you're offering them a certain amount of something. And uh, they are try the, the marketplace tries to guess what the currency... Most people don't understand that the marketplace is always setting the value of the currency. It isn't the value of the things that the currency buys that's changing. It's the value of the currency that's changing. And so when when somebody is... When there's several bidders trying to buy a house and uh, the high bid is accepted and the house gets sold, they just set the value of the currency, <laughs> you know, to purchase that thing. The thing just change much over time. And uh, so uh, the first 2,000 years of gold and silver were money. This is the marketplace determined, trying to figure out their value based on their rarity, how much of them was in circulation. Uh, it's just, it's the price discovery mechanism. And I believe that still works. And since there is actually more gold for investors to uh, buy on the exchanges and so on than there is silver, uh, once uh, gold goes past a certain price point, uh, a lot of the, uh, the common man will consider it too expensive. That's what happened back in the uh, late 70s. Gold went past $400 an ounce. And for the the common man, uh, you know, it was just $35 an ounce just a few years earlier. So it goes past 400 And uh, putting $400 into a, a, a single coin just seemed like a lot of, of uh, like it was really expensive at the time. And it, they, the public changed their preference to silver. It wasn't the Hunt brothers uh, trying to corner the market that caused silver to go to 50 bucks. It was really, you know, I interviewed Jeff Christian of CPM Group, uh, and uh, they're, prob they're one of the leading commodities analysts firms that specialize in the precious metals. And uh, he said that the Hunt brothers added uh, 50 to 75 cents per ounce to the price of silver at most. Uh, and really? I believe that. In fact, I, I wrote an article uh, there was going to be a chapter in my book about the Hunt brothers, but uh, we just had to. <laughs> I wrote, when I wrote my book, I, I accidentally wrote an 800 page book. And so nine chapters were cut out of it, and about half of every remaining chapter was cut out. And uh, so the Hunt brothers was one of the things that had to go. But my determination, uh, what I found out, from looking at all the evidence is that the Hunt brothers were actually the uh, sacrificial lambs used to uh, protect the dollar and cap the price of gold. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the price of silver peaked at 50 bucks and didn't go any further because the, uh, the commodities exchange changed the rules. They went to liquidation orders only, which means you can only close out future con futures contracts. You can't open up new ones. That means there's no new buyers. Without new buyers, the price can't go up. Yeah. And, right. and so the government put a cap on the price of silver at $50 and, ba and basically said, uh, until this rule is lifted, the price of silver can only go down. And, uh, on the commodities exchange on the floor, 
there's these, they call them pits, but it's just a group of guys standing around in a circle, screaming at each other and giving hand signals. Yeah. <laughs> and this place said the price of things, these people trading with each other. And uh, the gold pit, I would imagine, is fairly close to the silver pit. But regardless, if it was on the opposite side of the room, news travels at the speed of light in these places. And I would imagine that all those gold traders said, I'm selling. And so there's a reason that gold stopped at the same time as as silver. And it's because uh, they capped the price of silver. And so the hunt were used sacrificial lambs, I believe, to uh, keep gold from running away and saving and, and causing the U.S. dollar to fail back then. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that is very interesting. Um, I hadn't uh, really made quite that connection. I certainly make the connection that, that, uh, about um, uh, you know, the possible proximity of the pitches in, uh, in an open outcry market. Um, I do make the... Uh, I do... Um, uh, accept the point entirely that uh, people running a gold book are probably also involved with those running a silver book, so that it's connected there. Um, and there certainly is a common interest. Yeah, I mean, a lot of traders, uh, a lot of investors and so on, hold both gold and silver. And silver gets capped. And uh, what are they going to do with their gold? I, I think the gold traders are going, if they can do that to silver, we're next. And so uh, gold peaked at 850 uh, and then fell simply because the price of silver was capped due to a rule change. Yeah, no, that's interesting. There was a, a trial afterwards, and there was a bunch of finger pointing, and the Hunt brothers lost most of their fortune. Uh, and uh, uh, But, you know, that book uh, is a very in-depth study. Were they actually trying to corner the market and manipulate the price? And... Uh, nobody can actually build a solid case that says, yes, they did that and they're guilty. Uh, Bunker Hunt was actually afraid that the dollar was going to fail because for the first time in, in U.S. history, it was a fiat currency. And it, it had only been a few years, but he was pretty well convinced. There's another article um, online that you can look up uh, that was in Playboy called The Circle K Cowboys, I believe it is. And uh, it was... Written in Playboy, I think, in 1983 or 85, uh, and it was all about uh, the Hunt Brothers, and it was a, it's a very interesting article. Right. Um, can I uh, just sort of um, come back briefly to the U.S. economy? Um, I think we've, we agree that uh, things are looking extremely dangerous. Uh, the uh, government, I guess, must be preying on some sort of economic recovery, uh, so that uh, government tax uh, revenues uh, pick up, and um, the you know the problems sort of abate. What sort of probability to uh, to that towards that happening would you? I mean, do you think that's at all possible, Mike? No. Uh, throughout history, every time they've tried this, uh, silly stuff uh, that they're doing with the currency supplies, it's, it's led to disaster. It's always failed. There may be a very short-term uh, bounce in the economy, but uh, they are uh, trying to milk a little bit more uh, out of the near future at the complete expense of the far future. There's a disaster looming, and they're making it worse, and it's going to become known as the Bernanke bust. The uh, market is uh, ruthless and brutal when it comes to balancing things out. And there has been malinvestment and bubbles created everywhere through all of this fiat currency creation. And when the market forces cause things to uh, try and go back into equilibrium, they're going to cry that the free market doesn't work and we've got to fix it. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, the, yeah, I think that this line isn't the best of lines, I must say. Um, but this has been fascinating, and I'm sure that our listeners um, would like to find out a bit more about what you, you do. Uh, your um, website is uh, www.goldsilver.com. Uh, is that right? Yes, yeah. And uh, you also wrote uh, a guide to investing in gold and silver, um, which uh, presumably you can buy via Amazon or off your website. Yeah, you can buy it actually most places in the world. It's in 10 languages now. Oh, gosh, that's good. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, well, that's fantastic. Anyway, well, Mike, thank you very much indeed for that. And, um, you know, we must do this again sometime. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.